Hello, Tennessee Voices viewers and listeners. This is David Plazas, the Opinion and Engagement Director for the USA Today Network Tennessee and the Tennessean. And I'm excited because this is our 300th episode of the Tennessee Voices video podcast. And I have a very special guest who speaks to my heart because I love to read, I love literature, I love poetry. And my guest today is Alora Young, who is the 2021 Youth Poet Laureate of the Southern United States and author of the new book, Walking Gentry Home, a memoir of my foremothers in verse. Well, Laura, how are you doing today? Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm doing very well. How are you? Doing very well, thank you. And I've been a fan of your work for a long time, uh, whether you were performing at Tennessee State University for one of the Dr. King uh, celebrations or when I did my TEDx talk a few years ago at Belmont University, I saw you perform there. Uh, so I'm very impressed with uh, your work. And, and I'd love to talk to you first about uh, you know, what led you to become a poet? What was your journey to, to, to becoming a poet and a writer? My mom says, I first said I wanted to be a poet when I was two years old. So this has been my journey, my dream for as long as I can remember. I wrote my first poem when I was seven and I moved to Tennessee. It was called Stars of Sorrow, See You Tomorrow. <laughs> I was really sad about moving to Tennessee and it's marked a great adventure with writing poetry. And I think that poetry has always been a fundamental part of who I am from my literal obsession with like Shel Silverstein and Dr. Seuss to like, write. I used to carry poetry journals with me everywhere I went and write down poems. Like, and I would wake up out of my sleep and write poems in the middle of the night. It's just always been who I am and I don't think anything in the world I love as much as I love poetry. No, that, that's absolutely wonderful to hear. And uh, what would you describe as your style? Because I have seen you perform absolutely powerful pieces about uh, social justice and, uh, and, and really reckoning with ourselves here as Americans. And is this something, how did you lead up to that? How did you find your voice in that way? My style, I, I think, is just telling the truth with pizzazz. <laughs> um, so basically, I have always been fond of rhyming and metered poetry, because there's a lot of people who do poetry, and they do it in the more modern sense of without rhyme or like the traditional poetic constitution. But I'm a, I'm a partitioner of the lyric poetry. I love rhythm and meter and song and I like to think of my style more of as a modern day portrayal, like a West African griot would do, where I'm telling stories and I'm telling the truth and history through poetry. And I'm actually doing a lot of research specifically about how you can use poetry as a teaching tool, both for political argumentation and as an educational tool for students with learning disabilities. Oh, thank you so much for sharing uh, that with me. And I want to uh, talk a little bit about your memoir, uh, Walking Gentry Home. For yes. readers who are not yet familiar with it, tell us a little bit about the book and uh, what drew you to write it. Walking Gentry Home is my memoir in verse that chronicles 270 years of my family history in a small town in West Tennessee, entirely in poetry. And so basically what I've done is I've tracked my foremothers from my seven greats grandmother, Amy Coleman, all the way down to me in the modern day. And I wrote poems about all of their lives and I explored their stories and their histories. And I told the truth about what it means to be a black woman in America and how the American story is the story of the black woman, how we have always been the American story. And it all culminated into this book right here and I am incredibly proud of it and it's gotten really good reviews so far and I'm I think it's a pretty good book well no uh, well I hope people will will find it and I definitely will do so and uh, you know while I'm uh, vamping at this moment would you choose uh, maybe a quick section that you might read just uh, like sure. a, a minute or so because uh, I'd love to hear it in your voice and again, you know, if, uh, for those audience members who haven't seen Laura perform, you can certainly find her on YouTube and Instagram and other places where you'll find uh, uh, her 
recitation with pizzazz. Okay, let's see what's a good one. Maybe I'll do this one is in the titular gentry section. Gentry was my great grandmother, and it's called Gentry Dancing. And I feel like this poem is the poem that captures her essence the best. Gentry loved to dance. She would do the trucking with such passion you'd think she was entranced. She came alive in the moment. She grew up without a father, so there was no one to stop her from wearing the shortest skirts in the flock. When the freedom was placed in her hands, she chased the chance to skip and jive and hop. She wanted to be a kid. She had barely gotten a chance. She had to be her sister's and brother's second mother before she ever learned to dance. But now she knew how, and all she wanted was the chance to boogie. Gentry grew up playing hopscotch. She would sit on the floor and keep score as her brothers played stickball, flowing from inning to inning with Ortho B always winning, either because he cheated or because he was bigger. I ain't feeding the chickens, Mabel would yell. I did it last time, would be Hazel's reply. And Mabel would check for mama, then yell some more, and Hazel would cry, and inevitably, Gentry would end up feeding the darn chickens, like she always did. In the few moments of reprieve, she would crank up the porch radio and listen to the stations from Memphis and just dance. Take a moment to be unencumbered by chores or life or even shoes. Barefoot on the mottled porch, she would move free. And when the kettle whistled or the siblings arrived home from school, the moment would end. And she would take a rag to her feet, turn off the radio, and go on like it was a second that passed, faster than it takes for your eyes to close and reopen. That's beautiful. And you're making me think of the dancing right there as you're uh, as you're reciting it. So as 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 you write as you wrote that uh, the particular poem, um, how did you get into that voice? What you know? What were your choices that allowed you to basically, uh, you know, create this narrative? Well, so what I did to sort of get into the vibe of like all of these poems is I interviewed all of my family members, all of the women in my family on my mom's side. I did hour long interviews with all of them. And my aunt Jeanette is actually the one that told me this story. And she was a very good storyteller. So I listened to it and I picked up on all her little intonations about like Hazel crying and not wanting to feed the chickens and the way they joked and the way they played stickball and all of that together. It was just sort of an enrapturing moment. And I tried to capture that feeling and capture that story and put it into poetry. Excellent. Th th thank you. No, no, go on. Go on. No, that was it. All right. No, I, I, th I think it's exciting to see that the process of a writer, especially as you discover that. And I, I you reminded me of a time when I went, uh, I was in South America interviewing family members uh, about their own lives and trying to figure out that sense of identity and where I connected. And so I almost feel like through this book, you're connecting with your ancestors and, uh, you know, you're sharing their stories and in, in, uh, telling an American story. Exactly. I feel like it's such a powerful tool to be able to talk to all the women in my family and to learn all these stories. And I feel like I've grown so much closer to not just them, but to the women in my family who are no longer here. And through telling the story, I feel like I've learned a lot about the world and girlhood and how they relate to each other. And I think that this is a story that a lot of people can relate to because it, not just girls, not just women, I think this is a story that anyone who has ever had to grow up can relate to. That's excellent. Um... You know, one of the things before we continue, we're midway through the discussion where I always like to ask guests a little bit about what they've been doing during the time of COVID to stay healthy and well. Uh, a lot of times people, especially creative people or people in leadership positions, uh, don't take care of themselves as well as they should. But I am curious always what people are reading, watching, doing just to stay healthy and well during this time, especially during the hardest times of the pandemic. So, so what did you do? Well, a lot of what I did was I took up yoga and that was really helpful. 
and I've been reading poetry collections because poetry is my heart and it always brings me back to earth when I've gone off into the clouds and so currently I'm reading Soft Science by um, Franny Choi and it's been a really amazing experience and it's kept me grounded through all the excitement and anxiety of releasing a book. And so I've been really enjoying this book and I, I'm having a great time. So one of the things I learned a lot from uh, writers who I speak to is that they do read a whole lot in order to think, in order to be connected and, and, and so forth. And uh, uh, you talked about Shel Silverstein um, earlier, but I'd love to hear more a little bit about you know, some of the other influences that you have in your life. Ooh. Okay, so my favorite poet who is living is Morgan Parker. Um, my favorite poet who is non-living is Audre Lorde. And I love all the famous like black women poets in between Maya Angelou, Nikki Giovanni. I just am enthralled by their work and I love reading it. Um, and I've always been a fan of like children's poetry. So Shel Silverstein, I actually have all of his books right here. Mm. <laughs> I keep them on my shelf. I like read them all the time. Um, and this is my copy from when I was a child. I don't have the cover anymore, but I've had this thing. <sighs> as long as I can remember. And I know all the poems in it like by heart at this point. And Shel Silverstein has been such a major influence in my life. And I also love Dr. Seuss, but Shel Silverstein was always my guy. Yeah, I always, I remember reading Shel Silverstein. I'm, I'm being eaten by a bow constrictor. That's one of my favorite ones that, uh, that, that he uh, would do a very amusing one and even had a record back as a kid playing with his voice. Uh, this was a long time ago, but uh, yeah. with his voice, just reciting his own poetry. Um, you know, for people who are thinking about entering uh, the field of writing or poetry, what recommendations might you give them? My one piece of advice that I always give is write right now. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't even have to be good. It just has to be because art is it doesn't have to be anything as long as it is and it is your art because it's capturing your human experience and that's all you have to do to be an artist you have to create art and you have to capture your human experience and anyone can do it anywhere anytime just pick up a pen and write right now. now. For you as an as an artist, as a writer, uh, I know these last couple of years of both COVID and also the racial reckoning after the, the murder of George Floyd, I, I've had numerous conversations with guests about this particular topic of how you have processed it or if you have been able to process it at all and how it's reflected in, 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 uh, in the things that you say or the things that you write. I actually have written a lot of poems about the George Floyd, like about George Floyd and about that whole experience. And there's actually a couple in the book. Um, I have one where I talk about how my grandfather was a police officer and he was killed in the line of duty. And he died for a country that keeps killing his sons. And it really is something that is always it's sort of a morbid curiosity where it's like, how could you give up your life for a country that hates you? And yet somehow I still manage to love this country because it's where my family has been for generations. I've been a Tennessean for nine generations. My roots are here. Everything I love is here. And I wouldn't trade Tennessee for the world, but still, this country has so much vitriol for me, and yet I have so much love for it. And that's come through a lot in my poetry. Well, thank you for, for sharing that. It's very powerful words about that 
notion of, uh, of, of loving your country. I, I'm almost thinking when I read a lot of the works of um, uh, Nicole Hannah Jones uh, and uh, 1619 Project about that whole notion about black liberation being the story of American liberation. Uh, and um, I know there's been a lot of pushback to that. Have you seen it yourself in terms of having to tell that story and, uh, uh, you know, and, and help people see a truth that may not be comfortable? Absolutely. The truth is never comfortable. I mean, and that's something I've seen. My mom says it herself. She won't even listen to her portion of the book. She hasn't read it. Like the section that's titled Monette. Because seeing your truth written out, seeing your truth written into words is such a disarming endeavor. To, to read about your life and to experience your truth through another's eyes. And I think that's why sometimes we fight so hard to not experience the truth because it's painful. And it's been hard to get people to like open up to the realities of the world. And I think it's hard to get people to listen, but it's a worthy endeavor, I believe. You know, it's interesting that uh, I, I've often, as I've studied my own literature over many authors over the past several centuries, you know, literature, art, music have been ways to connect people in ways that uh, a simple conversation often can't. You know, a, a poem can connect somebody, whether it's through talking about love or pain or sadness. And um, have you found that through your poetry, you're able to start and sustain conversations perhaps in a different or better way than just a simple conversation? Absolutely. Bertolt Brecht has this quote, in the dark times, will there be singing? Yes, there will be singing about the dark times. And I think it's so powerful because the arts are something that persist in every dark time. And I actually am doing research about the power of writing as a tool for education because I use writing as a tool for education and I think that it is not only a powerful tool for memory and recall because rhyme and meter are such and mnemonic devices are so important to our learning as in, like as individuals who learn it is such a powerful tool but I think it's also a powerful tool for conveying the truth of your experience to somebody else in a way that no other form of media can do. No, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. You know, it's very powerful that we reflect our realities and our times. And often uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez during his Nobel Prize winning uh, speech uh, in, uh, talked about the fact that often reality is, is far more interesting and often stranger than, than fiction. And uh, so telling these stories are really, is really a powerful feat. Uh, now you are a Hillsborough High graduate. Uh, you yes. are currently in Swarthmore uh, yes. College, if I remember correctly. So tell us a little bit about how your college experience is going so far. Oh, absolutely amazing. <laughs> I could not have picked a better school. I am happier than I have ever been. And Swarthmore College is the most magical place on earth. Um, for example, like one thing that really captures the magic of Swarthmore is uh, there was one day where everybody, it was a LARPing event, a live action role play event where it's called the pterodactyl hunt. And they have people dress up as pterodactyls and you get to be a hunter and you get a styrofoam sword and you go on quest and they have people who are like mermaids and different magical creatures set up all around campus. And you go to those people and you do like quest and like adventures and you solve puzzles. And it was in the, it was like at nighttime all over campus. And it was the most magical experience I've ever had. And I would never choose another school over Swarthmore. Like, it's the place for me. Well, Alora, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me on the Tennessee Voices video podcast. Again, this is Alora Young. She's the 2021 Youth Poet Laureate of the Southern United States and the author of the new book, 
Walking Gentry Home, a memoir of my foremothers in verse. And uh, this is coming out uh, on July 28th, but I understand you have an event at Parnassus coming up too. Could you yes. uh, talk a little bit about that? On August 2nd, my book release party is at Parnassus at 6.30, Parnassus Books. And it's got, I've so far, I think a lot of people have signed up. I think it's going to be really fun, really exciting. And you can hear me talk about the book and crack jokes because I love cracking jokes in the microphone. It's going to be a very fun time. <laughs> well, Laura, I want to thank you very much. Before I let you go, I always like to ask guests if they would leave some words of wisdom for the audience to get them through this challenging time. Some words of wisdom for the audience. Just because you're down today doesn't mean you'll be down tomorrow. Excellent. Well, may you stay well and healthy. And I'm so grateful for your time here. Best of success in your book launch. Thank you.